Well, hi everyone, and welcome to uh, what are we EdTech Weekly EdTech Talk? I have a question, something like that. That, that sounds right. Today is uh, Sunday, uh, April sixth. My name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm sitting here in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Dave Cormier in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. I'm John Schenker in Stowe, Ohio. And I am Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea. Looking forward to being back together with the gang two weeks in a row. Hooray! Hey. Yeah. I think we're going to make it this time, guys. I think we're going to make so it. Too. I think I so, think too. So. Whole new format, totally new format. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got a plan now. So for those of you who don't, who have been following along with the Twitters, um, we are going to answer people's questions and actually better, hopefully, have smarter people than us answer people's questions and have us sort of follow along and repeat what smarter people said. So what we're looking to do is have you guys send questions to the eduquestions at eduquestion at eduquestion Twitter account or send it to any of us and then we'll send it out to the community and hopefully we'll be able to get some cool answers and then what we'll do is every week at this time we'll get together and talk about some of the questions people had, some of the answers people came up with and maybe drop in an opinion or two ourselves. Yep. So that's where we're at. And did we get any questions this week besides my own? Um, well, actually, there was a question that, that came up out of a conversation like this. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. And if, okay. if that's okay, Please I'm going to go with this question. So um, what, part of the idea here is that there's a lot of different communities that have a lot of different conversations. And one of the communities I'm involved in is called Riso14. And the question that's been swimming around in Riso14 for the last week, week and a half, and that somebody asked in this context, is how do I, if I'm working online, if I'm teaching online, how do I make it so that everybody feels like they're able to contribute? So in a classroom, you can look around the room and go, ah, oh, that person's shy, or ah, oh, that person's feeling nervous. Those are things that you can do really easily inside of a classroom. The question is, how do you go about creating room for people whenever we're working online? Jeff Lebo. That's something I'm actually struggling with uh, right now because I'm teaching an online call course without any scheduled synchronous time. And right. I've, I've done this before where, okay, we meet Tuesdays at 6 p.m. And that helps address the class bonding and, and getting a sense for where people are. But I'm really, I, I struggled this time with, uh, okay, here's the content. Please engage and I'll schedule virtual office hours and ask me questions anytime. And it was really easy for some people just to say, oh, it's an online course. I'll, I'll deal with that later. I'm really busy this month. Uh -huh. And so yeah. some people have really not engaged. Uh, and most of them have started catching up and, and are engaging. But I realize I really, I think in the beginning, it's really important to have a clear welcome, a clear first few steps that are a little bit required to, to mm -hmm. get them hooked in somehow. So too much freedom, bad. Yes. I try Dr. not Madden, to. Doctor of educational business. What do you think? <laughs> educational <laughs> business. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Um, well, you know what? This really is a nice segue because you know how much we love segues here at EdTech Talk slash EdTech Weekly. I have a question. And way back when, in 2006, um, and this now ties into what I was talking <laughs> trying to pull up before, I called uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier and I said, I have a class project and I'd love to work with you guys on um, what was what were we calling it back in the day? The Drupal CMS Academy. And we were going to develop, uh, or I did develop for you, a prototype design concept. <laughs> and you can tell how successful it is because I think the URL is now dead. Um, and the whole idea was we were going to create a community, a collaborative community, where people took on various roles to help and support each other. And I think at the time, like I said, it's called the Drupal Academy. We're going to teach each other how to use Drupal, much in the way we were doing at the time. Or not me, really, Jeff and Dave were doing the Webcast Academy. And so I was just reading through what my uh, my professor's comments were, and he's like, "If you build it, will <laughs> will they come?" was his question, which mm -hmm. I think ties into what you're saying. Uh, so this is again 2006. Uh, what you've created is an innovative, creative learning experience where no one is control yet everyone is in control. The question is, what will it evolve into? 
<laughs> what that was, the million dollar question. And really his questions are pretty much what you're saying. Like um, if it's completely up to everybody to kind of set their own rules and set roles, responsibilities. And I know back in the day I remember we had millions of conversations about this idea of experts and novices and um, you know, how does someone who does not know what's going on get help from someone who does know what's going on or if both parties don't know what's going on, who takes the role to do something? And so I wish I had an answer for the person, but I've been struggling with this since 2006 and I don't have a great answer for it. John Schinker, cynical show killer. <laughs> My problem is whenever I try to create or want to create something that's going to be collaborative online, I have to be really careful to not share too much stuff or to do too much too soon. Uh, in other words, if I start like a Google Doc and I put 800 words in that Google Doc, nobody else wants to change my stuff, right? They see it as my document that they're contributing to. It's not a shared thing anymore. So I think really what we need to do is get the engagement early before things actually gel so that multiple people feel like they're part of that community. Um, I heard this guy talking on a video who was at MIT and he was talking about how they identified the outliers in a course and tried to find the people who weren't connected to anybody else and bring them in and actually work uh, proactively to try to include everybody and engage everyone and I thought that was a really cool approach too. I don't know if you know anything about that. Yeah, that guy's a bit of a wingnut I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and that was specifically an open course, and, and in that course, that's actually part of the same community as RISO 14. Um, we had a lot of people on Twitter, and my concern was that Twitter being 24 hours a day, uh, and we had evidence, actually, somebody had posted this really great graph that said that people were tweeting 24 hours a day. Um, I'm not going to see all of those. Lots of people aren't going to see all of those. What I was hoping to do was find the people who were not already connected by doing uh, using something that's actually been developed by Mark Hoxie, but there's a variety of ways of doing that, but by scanning through the tweets that were out there to be able to try to find the people who weren't connected to other people. Uh, but I, in a sense, we're talking about two different kinds of things here. So there's an open community or an open course where no one is paid, um, everybody has engaged, and if you get, you know, we're more than happy if 10% of the people who register for an open course actually finish. In Jeff's scenario, um, I'm assuming the people you're teaching have paid Jeff, they have. So if you've got, let's say, 25 people who have paid, how do you guarantee, or how do you, I mean, you can't guarantee anything, but how do you how do you make the room for those people to make sure that their experience is one where they feel safe uh, and where they feel like contribution? Because we're all like collaborative folks and we're all like, oh, give us your opinion and tell us about yourself. And some people feel really nervous about that. Some people feel like, I mean, and I'm assuming, Jeff, that as a call course, you've got people from different cultures as well, where uh, they have... Yeah. Oh, no, they're all in one culture? No, I mean, mostly Koreans and uh, one South African. Okay. Um, and would you say that Koreans respond to... I mean, I, I'm asking... A, I mean, Koreans don't respond to, to questions in the same way that somebody in North America might, or socioeconomic differences and stuff, but... How do you make sure that they all have space to talk about their stuff? Like, how do you create room for all of those people? That's the big question for me. Yeah. And, um, I mean, they're dealing with a few things. They're dealing with a different structure of a course. They're dealing with technical barriers because in order to connect, they need to hang out and they haven't hung out before and mm -hmm. they were having to post on their blog and maybe they haven't blogged before. And right. so the those first few weeks that are really challenging technically, uh, socio-culturally in terms of the, the class culture. Um, and I don't think I have an answer yet, so I think that's an excellent question. And well, one thing I did wanted to chime in, going back into CMS Academy and Webcast Academy, um, you know, if you build it, will they come is part of the question, but will they come and will they continue to come and does that matter? You know, I mean, the Webcast Academy happened and for a while it was somewhat vibrant and then it wasn't. And is that okay? Is that a bad deal? I mean, I, I think when we talk about the other kind of learning, the open, let's get together and learn something, it doesn't have to be forever. 
You know, it can be a group of people coming together for a certain period of time, having right. whatever experience they're having, and then moving on. And by the way, CMS Academy is one of the domain names that I let go just last week. <laughs> Did you? Oh, no. Rad. I'm still keeping the New Media Academy. I thought that was <laughs> more embracing. More yeah. Complicated. But, you know, I face this um, with my little, um, and this ties in, all these are all variations on a theme. I've been teasing Dave about his maker physics, you know, he's got to be trendy with his maker, <laughs> you know, little uh, hashtag. But it's really, that's what it's about. It, yeah, oh, there you go. What's that? What do you got going there? What is that? Pluggable. What's that? I don't know. What that, help me. I don't understand. What's I think connection? it's spelled wrong. I think there's only one G. <laughs> Um, but it's it's this uh, um, for me anyway. It's this idea. I, I know we're talking about getting people engaged in conversations, but there's kind of to me there's kind of two two parts of it. Okay, we get people talking, but then how do we get them doing? Which was really the po point of like CMS Academy and Webcast Academy. Mm -hmm. How do we get folks to contribute and participate? Which gets a little bit more into the collective action stuff, um, which yeah. is a little bit different than um, networking and conversations. And, um, and I think, Jeff, you, you were kind of getting going down that path saying, does it really matter Is if once everybody's satisfied that they got what they not needed out of the experience and they're gone? Um, but how do you get, it's tying to what Dave's original question was, how do you get people not only to talk to each other but then to work together or, you know, take on a role or take on um, the, what, the initiative that t it takes to finish something, to start something. When do, and when do we get to the I have an answer part of this show? Yeah, we don't uh, really get to no, well, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's one answer. I mean, obviously, it would be funny, but I don't think there's one answer to any of this stuff. When you're, I know that <clears throat> when we were involved in planning some of the early MOOCs, we kept talking about the social contract and how we needed to reset the social contract. We needed to explain to people what it was they were getting into. So it was a free course, which meant that these humans were not going to talk to every one of those humans just because you registered. There are, you know, 1,500 of you and three of us, and there's no way that's going to happen. But more importantly, um, the rest of the social contract changes as well. So you're responsible for driving your own learning. And so much of our education system is about passivity. It's about receiving. It's about compliance. It's about normativity rather than about action or creation or making and that stuff. Particularly, unless, of course, you've got what, what I think of as fake constructivism, which is you can explore through your own ideas in this problem-based learning as long as you come up with this answer. Uh -huh. um, right? And I think that the hardest thing for me in terms of giving people space is understanding that it's not 25 identical people who need to change their views on education in order to engage. It's five people who totally get it, five people who totally hate it, seven people who aren't really that interested because their boss told them to take this course, and it, it's negotiating all that difference, right? And trying to explain, and you know, as we, we were having a discussion today, trying to explain to not only, like, the students, but also, like, the other faculty or the other people you work with, that if you're going to teach online, the first statement, the first move has to be, you're responsible, not me, because I'm not sitting in your house and I'm not dragging you to a computer and you're not forced to show up, so you have to be the person that does that. And I think that, to me, if anybody ever, when, when those kinds of questions come up, it, it's always, you need to negotiate with the student and with all those participants or students or whatever you're running, explain to them that they're responsible for themselves. And it sounds simple, but it actually it kind of blows people away because they're like, but 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 I just paid you to be responsible for me. Yeah, no. <laughs> I will I will help. I will engage. I will respond. I will take whatever I know and try to like participate with you. But if it's about me, then the moment I walk out the door, your whole thing is severed. Whereas if it's about you, then when you walk out the door, you just keep walking. You can keep doing things. And I think that for me, when I work online, I have failed terribly at trying to explain this to people often. But that's always the goal, is trying to explain to people that they need to be so much more responsible. And not only for showing up and doing their assignments on time and the rest of that stuff, and this speaks to the structure that I think that Jeff was talking about earlier, but also as controllers over what their learning means. And that, that, for a lot of people, is a struggle. And for some people, it's automatic, you know? So it's, it's, uh, 
it's a challenge no matter how you go at it. It's the new learning paradigm, right? It's just that idea that you have to be responsible for your own education. It's not someone telling you you have to follow these 11 steps and then we'll give you a degree and then off you go to, to find a job and consider yourself educated. Well, I mean, here is... Um, this is book one of Milman's Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Um, 1848 edition. It's awesome. I love this book. I have six of them. It used to be that this was the only access to any of this information that anybody had. And have you read that, or is it just a prop? I have <laughs> yeah. read... Look Here's at, my copy, at, too, Jeff. Find. Don't you have a copy? <laughs> <laughs> and I got a copy, and... He, he is dude. the funniest dude. Gibbons Wait, is page 42. Dude. It's his lorem ipsum. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that's what you used to pay for. You would pay for this and for me to explain this to you. Whereas now, what are you paying for? Like, you're, you're not paying for access to this. Go find it online. It exists, right? I'm not in this beautiful edition. But that's, that's a renegotiation. That's the difference that online is, right? You're not paying for access to content unless you're silly. You might be paying for the access to my choice of content, but not for the content itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm going back to what's what's happening? I like the agreeing. That's good. I like that. Keep that up. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I have a question. I have a question going back to your original question. So you had mentioned um, a difference between a paying crowd and a, uh, I guess Open it would crowd. be the, the, the yeah, it's like a formal informal educational setting, I guess, right? But, so why does does that matter? And I think we should talk about that because I think a lot of times people have cool experiences on Twitter or wherever it may be and then they're like let's do this in the classroom and then it fails so you know what is the uh, we've talked about this a million times obviously like the organic nature of some of the stuff that we try to then rep replicate and create frameworks <laughs> create a, cre a, a communication framework and then it just fails um, well, I, I don't see failure as black and white you know and, and I think like part of what I'm coming to terms with is I'm not going to please everyone. I'm not going to 100% succeed. And a lot of my students in this class are coming around and they're, they're engaging and they're sort of getting used to it. But there's one student, I sent her the nicest email in the world last week. I'm, I just wanted to touch base. I noticed you haven't done anything. How can I help? Blah, blah. And I haven't heard anything. And I'm not optimistic. Maybe she's going to have a great week six. We'll see. When it's week an six. open course and no one's paying, I care a lot less. Uh, if 20% of a MOOC shows up and engages, that's great. As someone who's being paid for people to, who are also paid and some drop out, that uh, has more institutional ramifications. Yeah, for yeah, sure. And if you're, if you're K-12, then you're going to be evaluated based on how your students perform or, or what they learn, though... You know, there are lots of ways to measure that, regardless of whether they take ownership or feel engaged in that learning. So, you know, once you get into the pre-adult stages, then you have to be responsible for them. Well, last semester, maybe a year ago, um, we did a consulting skills for instructional designers class. And so the students had to go out, find a client, and I thought, okay, well, this is going to be like herding cats. So the only way I can help to manage this and get people giving me feedback as if they have a blog. Right away, free, people free. I don't want it outside so the world can see it. Okay, let's kind of end <laughs> at Jeff's point. This is a class. Okay, got to play by some, you know, some formalized rules here. So we put it within the LMS. Even that, it was hard to get people to post. Um, they were, uh, it was obviously a new experience for them. Their new designers never had a real life client. And they didn't want to point, post the stuff that they were saying didn't work or they didn't weren't sure of. Um, and so... You know, so I've talked to other people then and said, well, you shouldn't have made it a blog. You should have just had them do an individual reflection that they turned in only to you to make sure that they did it. And so then pretty soon it's like, well, well where's, you know, <laughs> where's Why the community? Why just put it in where's an envelope the... and mail it to me, frankly? frankly. But I think that ties in uh, to kind of what we were saying at the beginning. It, it, you know, we kind of make an assumption that this is works for everybody, but for cultural reasons or for whatever reasons. Yeah, is it bad to impose what's working for us on other people because it works? It has worked at times for us. I just I want to say one thing to that. For somebody who absolutely hates 
to be sitting in a traditional physical classroom. Um, I nobody ever asked me about how I felt about sitting in a chair for an hour listening to somebody talk. Um, and I wasn't given that option. Um, I still don't like sitting for an hour. Oh, a beautiful speaker, I would totally listen to them for an hour. But, you know, that's not where we're blessed to be for most of our educational career. So I, I think one of the things about the online space that people need to remember is that we're all accustomed to the weaknesses of the physical space. Um, if you sit down and add them up, um, they're not a whole lot different. And I think that's something else to keep in mind as well, is that um, we're accustomed to giving in to the, oh, it smells terrible in here. And, you know, all those things that are the reality of a physical space. Uh, is that you? I don't think that's me. I think that's somebody else, you know? Um, which is, you know, the face-to-face -face equivalent of, oh, my, you know, wireless just dropped out. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I think that's something else to remember, too, is that much like, I mean, everybody's kind of saying this, too, but you can't put the bar too high, and you can't put it in an imaginary space. So when we're comparing to face-to-face, -to -face, we're not comparing perfection. You know, we're comparing the, the, oh, yeah, all the get, warts and... <laughs> exactly. We, we should just not have the comparison conversation. Cause, <laughs> that's right, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. um, that but is yeah, a whole thing we've never gotten into is the aroma of ed tech. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we'd have to worry about with the uh, it smells yeah. like smoke. Um, but I, you know, I, I think it does. It, it does. It's an important question to all of us that get excited about creating CMS academies and MOOCs and you know whatever we're doing. Um, how do you? How much do you push it? And is is the pushing um, for their own good? I'm pushing you for your own good. You get out there and do this. <laughs> Um, and then, and kind of now to my question, what are we at minute 23 that I raised this week? Um, and I, I see one of the people from my project is um, is joining or tuning in right now. And we're right in the midst of providing feedback to the students. So much like we talked about the way back in the day at the uh, CMS Academy, how do we have folks that are doing stuff and creating stuff get feedback from those who maybe done it before or have some different perspective? Um, and that's hard because people, you're asking people to do something that they would rather watch television or <laughs> they have like a million other things to do. It's like, time out, folks, help us out and, and evaluate this. And then once they do, how do you kind of take it to that next level and say, well, that feedback isn't great? <laughs> you know, like, kind of ignore that. <laughs> don't, Thanks don't, very don't much for your time. I wish you'd used exactly. it for something else. Exactly. <laughs> um, like, don't listen to that. But you know, so then you start like filtering the feedback that comes in, trying to yeah. give, um, you know, assess the feedback that's coming back. And so those, these again, these are all things. That's why I thought it was so cool when I, I saw our stuff from 2006. This is all stuff we talked about then. So I don't have the answer today. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's it's the whole feedback thing. Like, I want to get the whole world to come and respond to. I've stopped doing it, frankly, because um, unless I pick out a specific person because there's a specific topic, what I do tend to do, which I find is more seems to have more success, is to invite a guest in, have that guest present, and then have that guest interact because then they have a context for who that person is. So we had, uh, I, I, I filled in for one of Bonnie's classes earlier this year, and Julia Forsyth came in. Do you guys know Julia? Mm -mm. No. Oh, she's so fantastic. Um, I'll send you some links, so we'll get it into the, she's, she's a visual um, educator-y, she has a lot of art She makes stuff. cool drawings. She's actually, she makes <laughs> awesome drawings, but she's also a very cool educator in a lot of respects. She's at Brock University. Um, but she came in to speak about visual note-taking and that kind of stuff to the class, and then the class started engaging with her after. And then when she made comments on their stuff, it made more contextual sense to them because it was somebody whose face they'd seen, whose work they'd talked to, who they'd engaged with. We had some back and forth in class. It does mean that you're going to end up having to do that for other people. Um, so, you know, a little exchange there. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're teaching a three-hour class, which when I do face-to-face, -face, that's what I end up doing is three-hour classes, uh, it's really nice to have another voice in there. I mean, I'm more than willing to talk for three straight hours, uh, but I'm not necessarily sure that anybody wants to hear me talk for three straight hours. Um, so it's nice to have somebody come yeah, in. John face to face. Happen. They don't have a choice. They just they're stuck there, right? Stuck there. Where are they going to go? Not like See? you can just do, switch tabs and do something else for 
an hour. Yeah, fair. But fair. I, I do think context and relevance are important to both topics we're talking about. One, how to get people engaged. The more I can help students kind of see that, oh, this is what I can do in my class. This is how I, I'm going to learn something that's going to help me next week. Well, the right. More relevance goes a long engaged. way toward engagement. Right. And in terms of feedback, Jen, I thought the session I lurked in of yours a couple weeks ago was great feedback. You know, and it was the community giving feedback. It was people saying, okay, this is what I've done so far. And someone else saying, okay, well, I see how you can do this, but what about tweaking it this way? That seemed to be a real meaningful exchange of feedback. It was. And at a general level, I was pretty happy. And then we kind of turned the corner. Now we're getting, we've got, you know, four weeks to the deliverable. Now we're talking nitty gritty. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now, for example, the students are working on and the, the strategies to engage the, the whatever their little instructional module they're working in. And so it's all, you know, how are they going to present content? How are they going to have students practice stuff? How are they going to, so within their own module. So now, now it's like kind of getting kind of meta here. <laughs> we're kind of stepping back because they're designing instruction, and I'm helping. I'm, I'm instructing them on how to how to uh, design instruction. But um, uh, so those types of where it takes more time, where someone really has to go. What are they trying to do? <laughs> what is it? How will this lesson look? And what's the sequence? And that takes a tremendous amount of time. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this even one day what you were you were talking about years ago, uh, peer re the, the peer review process uh, for academic mm -hmm. journals. You know, people are like, oh, that's so old school, or that's ridiculous. Well, no, my God, that's your one chance in life to have someone take an hour and read your stuff and and pick it apart. And it's that level of feedback that. Um, I just I just can't get my finger on how to do it. Besides going old school, completely old, and then have one person who's in a role of authority <laughs> sit there and red mark the paper. Um, yeah, I don't think you're going to get that kind of high level input from people all that often. I mean, to me, it's a magical moment if you get somebody to engage in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to pay him. You you pay him yeah. as a professor, right? Yeah, I mean, if I. <clears throat> If I look at my schedule and the amount of time I have to put into that kind of effort, I I don't know when it would get done. I might say I might want to do it, but actually doing it would be something totally different. Whereas if, like, the John, uh, I think it was last year, John and I did a, a Google Hangout for one of my classes. Was that last year, John? Mm, I think it's been a couple years, Dave. Was <laughs> it? It's been a while. Huh? Yeah. Um, at some point in the 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lead-in to one of the classes. I mean, we've all done bits and yeah. pieces of those things. Yeah. And, and I find that those those I can imagine and maybe some follow-up after, somebody sit down with, with that kind of work at that level, who knows, finding somebody who knows enough and, and having them engage enough, like, I don't know if that's going to happen. But there's always the rhizome as the feedback. You know, I'm, I'm tuning into the Rhizo 14 back channel here between Clarissa and Scott. Hello, for your uh -huh. Scott. Thanks for tuning in. And like you know, they're they're offering feedback on on this, and I always have so much trouble following Rizo conversations. They get very deep very quickly. Uh, <laughs> those those but, people are serious business, man. <laughs> when they start when they start in on a topic, it's uh, yeah, no, they're uh, that's that's a really great crowd. I mean, that's I I feel like I've been part of two communities that have really run in the almost 10 years. One of them is EdTech Talk and the other one, like this Rizo 14 business, looks like it might actually be doing that. But that's an awful lot of trying for not, not very much success. So uh, what are you doing? They seem engaged. What are you doing in the, um, in your maker physics thing? Everybody's got stuff, you know, creating, 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 creating. Like how do you, who, how do you step back and go, okay, we like this and we're going to run with this and this not so much. <laughs> you know, how, or does that, That's a perfect that, question for your... next week when we return to I Have a Question. All right. But right All right. now we just hit our 30-minute mark. <laughs> All right. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. See what I did there? I did. Like I did. I liked it very wow. much. A teaser <laughs> and everything. Come back next week when we'll talk. Next week when Dave will say, Jen, you were saying, and Jennifer will say, <laughs> What was I talking about? <laughs> next week for I still have a question. Exactly. Fast forward to 2020, and we're yeah. having the same question that was asked in 2006. All right, I'm with you. Half hour. We're in. We're out. And so this do is we have where we ask for the same questions for, next, next well, week? I, I, I think the we same have ones. Do we answer I think them? We should all talk at the same time. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Hangouts well, seem to way, like this. Don't we want to ask the community for their feedback? I mean, we've got the question. We didn't come up with that yeah, much in the way of answers. Dave, how but... do they do that? Yeah. Um, if you would like to um, ask a question uh, and have us uh, send it out for people to answer, answer actually, <laughs> actually take a run at answering it, I can't, pr can't promise we will. We will talk about it. If you go on to the Twitters and send an at to eduquestion, E-D-U question, um, or if you go ahead and uh, send a tweet to any of the four people here, uh, we'll get your question out there. We'll send it out to various groups and, and post it on the EdTech Talk Facebook chat and see if we can't start a conversation around it beforehand. And then uh, we'll pick a couple of those, those questions and talk about them on the show next week. Um, same time, same place. Uh, 9 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. So that means Probably. anything to anybody other than me. For the three people that matter, right? <laughs> Atlantic Daylight Time? It may be Daylight Time. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the difference. <laughs> Midnight UTC. <laughs> Midnight UTC. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. And thanks. Uh, that, like, and you can also comment on this video wherever you find it. And we'll also respond to that as well. Which will be at edtechtalk.com, I believe. And, and YouTube. YouTube. Indeed. All right. Ta-ta for all right. now. Have a great week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.